The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, No Rest for the Weary, a wily and witty hero on a journey of destiny, and a private investigator must survive the mean streets of the City of Cries, plus a wild chase through the billion worlds of the 10th millennium, and we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Uncompromising Honor, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I'm Bain Consulting Editor David F. Shirerod, sitting in for Tony Daniel. Today we bring you my conversation with James L. Cambius about his new novel, The Goodell Operation, which is out now in trade paperback and ebook formats. The Goodell Operation follows an AI and his boy on a wild chase through the billion worlds of the 10th millennium in search of a mythical superweapon that may save civilization or doom it. But first, the news. The May mass market paperbacks are in. First up, Mama Luke's by Jerry Purnell. It's been 13 long years since Rick Galloway was shanghaied and carted away by a flying saucer to the planet Tran, where humans were both administrators and slaves. Now things are about to change yet again. New starmen have arrived on Tran with dangerous gifts and star weapons none have faced before. Rick Galloway's mission on Tran is about to be turned on its head. The final novel by legendary author Jerry Purnell with contributions from New York Times bestselling author David Weber and the author's son, Philip Purnell. Next up, Penrick's Travels by Lois McMaster Bujold. Footloose nobleman Penrick grows wiser and even more wily as he journeys from young lord to sorcerer and scholar in the bastard's order. Oh, and he deals with intrigue and solves mystery along the way. Three stories of epic fantasy from Sefwa Grandmaster Lois McMaster Bujold includes Penrick's Mission, Mira's Last Dance, and The Prisoner of Limnos. and The Vanished Seas by Catherine Acero. The powerful elite of the City of Cries are disappearing and only Major Bajan, who grew up in the Undercity can find them if she isn't murdered first. But if she survives, waiting for Bajan is a revelation that may transform Cries and the Empire itself forever. And head on over to Bain.com and check out the May Rubies and Rust Catherine Acero ebook sale. To celebrate the release of The Vanished Seas, we're offering major discounts on all of Catherine Acero's titles. These discounts apply wherever Bain ebooks are sold, and it runs through the end of this month, May 31st, 2021. And that's it for the news. And now my conversation with James L. Cambius about his new novel, The Goodell Operation. All right, I want to welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour, James L. Cambius. He's a writer and game designer, the co-founder of Zygote Games. He's been nominated for the James Tiptree Jr. Award and the 2001 John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer, what I guess they call the Astounding Award these days, but lo, those many years ago, it was, uh, it was the Campbell Award. Uh, this is his third novel with Bain that we'll be talking about today. It is called The Godel Operation. And it's out now in trade paperback and ebook formats. Uh, all your favorite ebook formats, DRM free at Bain.com, as always. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the Bain Free Radio Hour and talking about the book. Glad to be here. So this is, uh, I had a lot of fun reading this, you know, that always makes these podcasts uh, all the more enjoyable. This is a far future, uh, what, you have it in your email thing, or, you know, I, a chase through far future uh, in the solar system. It's um, a hard SF space opera. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. Um, and so I wonder if you would, I want to talk about the world that you set up, uh, set something like 8,000 years in the future. But first, I want to talk about the main players that we've got. And uh, since this is 8,000 years in the future, they're not named Tom, Dick, and Harry. So if I get the pronunciations wrong, you, you feel free to correct me. 
But um, let's talk about sort of the main players of, uh, let's start, I guess, with the narrator, uh, Daslak. Or Daslak, or at Daslak. least the, the use he's, that's the name he's using at the time the story takes place. Right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about him, because um, he's, he's a unique a, narrator. Yeah. Yes, he's an artificial intelligence. He's, uh, he's as, as the story begins, as he puts it, he was living in a, in a spider mech body, which I assume is, you know, a fairly standard uh, multi-legged robot, little robot used for uh, repair and maintenance and whatnot, which are practically ubiquitous in that time. And part of that, of course, is that way he can be very anonymous, or it can be very anonymous. He's not a he, it's not a he although I think of him as a he. Um, and uh, uh, Daslak is uh, an indeterminate age. He keeps describing himself as old and cunning, but he never quite reveals how old he is. It is. And um, as the story begins, it is uh, living in a remote uh, space habitat in the in the Uranus Lagrangian points, um, but has become fond of a young human and doesn't like to see this young human unhappy. Yes, yeah, so that brings us to another character, which is Z, um, who is sort of the companion. They work together uh, doing repairs at the beginning of the book. Um, and then they get embroiled in some uh, intrigue with a couple of uh, is females of the species, women, um, Z's species anyway. Yeah, and uh, Adya. So, if you could tell us a little bit about them, just to kind of get the players in place before we. Sure. So, Z is a very straightforward, decent young man, uh, which is the source of many of his problems. Actually, <laughs> um, he's he's smarter than most people think he is, um, because. Too many people think that being clever means being devious and, and deceptive, <clears throat> whereas he is always very straightforward. That's one of the sort of continuing, I hope, comic bits in the book is how his straightforwardness continually undercuts everybody else's devious plans. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as to, uh, he's a, you know, a young man, he's good at the sport of um, Nules Grima, which is uh, zero gravity stick fighting, which is a, a martial art in the in the distant future of the billion worlds. And um, um, he goes searching for a young woman he believes he once was in love with and finds someone who might be her but might not be and finds uh, a, a, a rival for his affections. Um, so the first young woman, the woman he's searching for, is named Kusti Sendoa, and um, he finds her, or believes he does, and um, uh, she is searching for the Gödel trigger, which is where the title comes from, a, a super, a conceptual super weapon which can destroy the minds of artificial intelligences. Uh, her rival, both in the search for the Gödel trigger and for Z's affections is um, Adya Elso, who is a young woman from an aristocratic family on the Uranus moon of Miranda. And um, Adya uh, uh, you know, very well brought up and uh, her family paid extra to have uh, color changing skin so that her skin color reflects her mood. And so I'm always, whenever she's talking, I'm always describing what color she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so we touched a little bit about the Godel trigger. I've been saying Godel, I've been saying it wrong. Godel trigger. Um, I don't actually know how the mathematician said his name right. either. Okay, um, either way, uh, I guess then. But, and we hinted at the billion worlds. So now that we've got the characters down, let's talk about this uh, hard science fiction space opera you've created. What does the solar system look like in the year 10,000 in your conceptualization in this novel? And so maybe walk us through the history of it with the inner ring and all that that good stuff. Yeah. Right. So the, I wanted to write uh, this back in, I think it was something like 2012. I have the document where I started musing about this on in, in text somewhere. Um, I, I, I started thinking about, well, what would it be like to live in an actual Dyson sphere? Because when Freeman Dyson came up with the concept of the Dyson sphere, he wasn't talking about a big rigid ball around a star like in that Star Trek episode. He was talking about 
you know, he was using physics jargon. So what he meant is any shell of material, presumably in orbit, that intercepts all of that star's light and for usable energy. And so because so many writers have used the idea of a single rigid object as a Dyson sphere, you will often see the term Dyson swarm used to refer to a whole bunch of smaller objects orbiting around a star every which way, serving the same purpose. And that's the future of the 10th millennium. Um, and moreover, that's been the future for them for a very long time, because I didn't just want to set it in the early days of a Dyson sphere civilization. I wanted to set it when that is the majority of human civilization. Mm -hmm. So I did some math and, you know, this sort of thing could be accomplished in a couple of millennia. It seems outrageous, but when you start doing the math about, you know, self-replicating robots and stuff, it actually would only take a few centuries to build. Huh. Um, so, you know, most of human history from the viewpoint of my, my 10th millennium characters, that's, that's where humans have lived. They've lived in a billion plus space habitats and asteroids and terraform planets and terraform moons orbiting the sun and Jupiter and all the major planets. And that's, that's history. Then there's this, you know, semi-mythical prehistory, you know, of the 20th, the second millennium and earlier when people were only lived on one planet. Mm -hmm. And so there's the inner ring, and that is, if I'm reading it right, um, primarily reserved for machine intelligence. Is, it, is that right? And then all the biologicals right. live out. And right. the, the inner ring is where Mercury used to be, as I put it. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's made of it's made of the planet Mercury and some other stuff, and it's a, a ring around the sun, and it is the control center for what's called star lifting, which is a, a concept developed by a physicist in the 1980s named um, Dave Criswell, um, who came up with the idea that, you know, you can harvest more than just energy from a star, you can harvest matter. You can manipulate it to uh, emit puffs of, of hydrogen. And of course, those puffs are gonna be, you know, gigatons, billions of gigatons. And so, you know, yeah, most of it's hydrogen, but you're gonna have, oh, by the way, millions of tons of iron, plutonium, radium, gold, carbon, whatever, in along with it. So, you know, the sun is where 99% of the mass of the solar system is, so why not mine it? Mm -hmm. And so that's what the inner ring was built for. And it's so, it's packed with supercomputers. It basically is a giant supercomputer circling the sun. And there was this unfortunate incident in the fourth millennium when the artificial intelligences of the inner ring decided to exterminate all organic life in the solar system. And this was the, the great war of the ring, <laughs> um, uh, which, uh, you know, took up much of the fourth millennium and uh, depopulated whole planets and, and saw vast damage done to the solar system. And eventually the machines gave up. The humans think they won. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. He said something I was going to ask about. And so how does, I guess, so the, the Godel trigger is sort of the MacGuffin that drives the plot of this, right. um, this novel. And the and, reason that characters want to have a weapon that can destroy the minds of artificial intelligences mm -hmm. is because there's this inner ring of trillions of super minds, which controls the sun, just sort of sitting there staring mm -hmm. balefully at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is, um, do you want to talk about what it is a little bit more? I know we touched on it, but... Uh... The concept is fairly straightforward. Uh, Kurt Gödel, the mathematician, and okay, I am not a mathematician. So if there are any mathematicians listening to this, what if I get something wrong, please have pity on me. But um, uh, he was a, a famous mathematician in the mid 20th century. I believe he died in the 60s. And um, he, he was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And um, um, he, one of his contributions to, to mathematics, which overlaps into what became the field of computer science was the concept of the incompleteness theorem, which is very, very, very high level mathematics where you're essentially applying mathematical tools to sets of mathematical statements, in his case, Bertrand Russell's uh, Principia Mathematica, where Gödel attempted to show, and 
apparently did that any formal system of mathematics and thus by extension any system of logical statements which means basically anything um uh is going to there will be statements that cannot be made in it that you that no system of logical statements is is universal and that there are statements which cannot be made and thus would essentially be incomputable or incomprehensible in it. And so the idea behind the Gödel trigger as the conceptual weapon is that somebody sat down and came up with, you know, a set of statements. Presumably it's something a little more sophisticated than Captain Kirk's, you know, listen to me very carefully, I'm lying to you mm -hmm. um, uh, from the old Star Trek series, but you know, something of a comparable nature anyway, uh, that would uh, uh, freak out and destroy artificial intelligences. Um, that's what everyone in the story believes. And I'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, I don't want to spoil too much. Um, let me see. Uh, what was I going to ask? And, about and in fact, that gives me an out because even if then I'm getting Godel's work completely wrong, it doesn't matter because that's diegetic error. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, from within the story, right. Um, Although I was going to talk a little bit more about Daslack because he was such a fun narrator. And I wonder, was that always your one? Was that always your intent was to have an AI as the narrator? And then two, I just wanted to talk about the little like, because he's been around a long time. And so he knows yeah. humans, but he still doesn't quite get them. Like he's, you know, I, and I just love those little moments where he'd be like, I don't know, like he talks about reprodu reproduction and he's like, why would you want to go through this? This is, you can just do it in a, you know, I can't remember the term for it, you know, grow babies, like you can print them out. They'll yeah. insist on it, you know, <laughs> right? And I love those, that kind of interplay of him, like being an AI, not really understanding humanity. Because yes, he does not have the slightest bit of, of uh, Pinocchio yeah. syndrome yeah. or the Tin Man. He has no desire to be a human. Yeah. Being. He likes humans, but he doesn't want to be one and mm -hmm. doesn't really understand why anybody would. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Daslak's a fun character. He, Daslak, he, it was the first character I began writing because okay. back when I had this idea, I sat down and sort of, I guess if I was a filmmaker, I would say shot some test footage. But in my case, it was, you know, sort of try to started writing my way into what might become a story. And, and that eventually became, well, much revised, became the, the first chapter of, of the Godel Trigger. But um, that was what I used basically as sort of my my sample text when I pitched this novel to um, uh, Bain Books. As a matter of fact, it's like, here's what I've written already. You know, I think this is pretty fun. What do y'all think? And evidently they agreed. Um, so yeah, Das like is is you know clever and maybe not as clever as he as it thinks it is, but quite clever anyway. Devious as a result of a long and complicated life. Um, um, and suspicious um, to the point um, at times almost of paranoia um, and uh, uh, always prefers to take a, a devious approach and thus you know it makes a great foil for Z with his blunt directness. Mm -hmm. Yeah I like you with Z you were talking about being very direct and like there's several points when everyone's trying to scheme if we do that. And he's like, what if we just ask them? And you know, and people be like, should we just ask? He's like, we could just ask, you know? And I thought that was always a, a fun, like you said, that interplay between the characters there. Um, so I wonder too about the world, cause this has got that great, Tony doesn't like it when I say golden age or old fashioned, but I, I mean it as a compliment, but sometimes I think people read that wrong in advertising copy, but it's got that great, sense of wonder with this this big um world building and i wonder like how do you you know a lot of this you obviously have a lot of history that you've built up in it but then i just think there's all these fun bits and i just wonder how you approach those of like names for food or like you know you talked about the the stick fighting and how you kind of trace this history of like it started out you know this way and then it became formalized and then it became a game but then it became an art form but now it's a game again or something like that and um it's because I'm an obsessive nerd about this kind of thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm also an obsessive nerd about food. So when I'm inventing foodstuffs or thinking of what people might be eating in that distant future, mm -hmm. I either look for real world things or 
make up plausible ones and then come up with, with names for them, making heavy use of, of foreign language dictionaries and I'll be candid, Google Translate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because yes, one of the things I d absolutely did not want to have is a lot of future English because, I mean, even the words I'm using, frankly, will be obsolete and, you know, any more than writing a novel in Sumerian set in our day would be yeah. <laughs> plausible. Sure. Yeah, but... Um... Although one can assume there'll be a bit more cultural continuity once you have, you know, widespread electronic storage media and mm -hmm. longer lifespans and things like that. Yeah, um, let me think what, let me see here. Uh, oh, and so let's talk about, so each world, I guess, bill, you would say a billion worlds, has sort of an AI um, running it, right? Um, um, many of them do, okay. some of them do not. Okay, yeah, so I was just wondering if you could talk about, um, they run into a couple, early on there's the, uh, the one where they're from, I can't remember the name now, but this, Abba. yeah, it takes the form of a penguin. <laughs> avatar. Only, in, only in virtual space. Yes, Abba. right, right, yes. Um, so uh, what was, how did, I guess, how does that come about and what is that, how does that affect the story that we're seeing, that we're reading about here and, and how do these, he calls it, you see early on Daslick says, so I've done what people have done for millennia. I talk to God, meaning the God that runs the, yeah. the, the and place they live. You know. A lot of these beings are by any, by any rational standard, godlike in power and knowledge. Um, some of them aren't very nice gods though. Um, um, so yes, there's, while there is the threat of the inner ring ever present, civilization in the 10th millennium it depends on artificial intelligences and they are considered people they're they're just people who are digital people um and you know we are millennia past any you know uh, uh, uh hostility or mistrust or or unfamiliarity at that point um uh, so the the digital minds they can scale up a lot better than biological minds can. So uh, uh, I mentioned, and I have a whole bunch of notes about this, of course, there's different levels of intelligences where humans are baseline intelligences, which is, um, and then there's higher level intelligences, each of which is approximately an order of magnitude smarter. So, you know, a level two intelligence is about 10 times as intelligent as an ordinary human. A level three is a thousand times. That's all. Right, and then there's like bots that are sub baseline, right? Right, bots are robots. Yeah, they're stupid robots. machines. They're not people. They're, they, right. they may be quite clever by our standards, but you know, they're still you know, Watson playing chess or, or the thing that built your car or whatever. Those are bots. <laughs> oh, so the other they're thing cool. is there's also, um, just like so there's people that have also uploaded themselves or augmented themselves so yeah. cyborgs and stuff but then there is other I, not race species i guess is the word you know you have corvids and and that have been uplifted yes, as because well. we've had ten thousand years of advanced biological technology yeah. as well so we've been creating uh, uplifted species that corvids which are sort of ravens um uh, upgraded obviously um, um, cephalopods, uh, uh, octopuses, um, because you got to have space octopuses, right? <laughs> um, one of the characters in the story is Pelagia, who is a spaceship with a, a orca, an uplifted orca brain controlling her. Um, uh, uh, dogs, cats, there's a cat that was one of the, one of the main, main characters in the yeah. story is, a, is an intelligent cat. Um, dragons, dolphins, um, and I don't know if I mentioned, but I know in my notes, I've also got bears, raccoons, lotors, they're called, um, um, uplifted, um, rats called arnets, um, all the other primates, of course, yeah, Jim. um, yeah. elephants, although, and, um, dinosaurs, uh, recreated, essentially artificially created dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but the the novel that i'm working on now which also takes place in that setting one of the characters is a dinosaur <laughs> so what's it like i mean like 
writing from those, I guess, because they're really all essentially human at this point, right? There, there's not, it's in well, terms of intelligence, right? I do have that excuse that all of these are either created by or created by things created by humans. So mm -hmm. there's going to be some of our mental yeah. patterns are going to flow into them just by virtue of how we define intelligence. But I do try to make the non-humans different if mm -hmm. I can. Um, um, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, that, that Daslag has a very different attitude about things than his human comrades do. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, in the novel I'm working on now, you know, the dinosaur and the Corvid characters have very different viewpoints from the, from the human main character. Um, and, uh, it's a it's a rule of thumb I try to follow is that if you're going to have a non-human character, they better be something other than just someone in a costume. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think that really came across, especially you know, well, like with the the cat character too, but especially with Pelagia, um, you know, because she's not even an orca; she's like an orca in a ship, but she uses this right. plushy avatar or whatever, and um, yeah, she uses a little plush uh, killer yeah. whale doll yeah. as her. As her uh, Pro, as our remote uh, 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 drone avatar. Right. And I love, to, you know, it's hard to talk about because so much of this was just, I love being immersed in this world because like you said, it's hard science fiction. It felt so plausible and yet it felt so alien at the same time. And I think that is something that is hard to do. So I will commend you on it. Um, and it's not something, I don't, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I think we're missing that in science fiction a lot. You know, I think that, and I think because it's hard, but um, is that something that's always appealed to you as sort of this like really, I will you said you're a nerd about this, this really rigorous kind of extrapolating out. The thing that I really like to feel when I'm reading a book or watching a movie is the feeling inside in the back of my head that yes, that's what it would be like. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it can be in a fantastic context, um, you know, I, I really love the original um, Iron Man because, you know, it felt like, yes, that's what developing, you know, a superhero suit would be like, you know, mm. it felt right. Um, and um, with this, I very much wanted to play with the, with the net up in the middle of the court, so to speak, where, you know, I'm, I'm not allowing myself any magic. There's the, uh, things can get a little fuzzy when, the technology of the inner ring is involved, but there's nothing that actually breaks physical laws as we understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no psychic powers. There's no faster than light travel. I'm cagey about aliens because um, I don't want to pin myself down too much because I feel like right now we're living in a time when statements on that could be made obsolete very rapidly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know the breakthrough project. The breakthrough listen project could could make this story obsolete if I if I talk about aliens. So I'm just mm -hmm. not going to bring them up. Yeah. <laughs> and I I guess like you said, although one I guess an uh, uh, author always hopes your work will live on. But probably I hope I'm not insulting you by saying eight thousand years from now we may not be reading this book. So if you're wrong, you know, people can't call you out. It's always it's the problem. It's not the 8,000 years, it's the eight years or, you know, yeah. 20 years. That exactly. So I'm right. worried about. Exactly. Because I do read a lot of golden age classic science mm -hmm. fiction and it is sometimes, it's not the, usually actually it's not the scientific failures that are jarring. It's the, it's the non-scientific failures to extrapolate where People are still using beatnik slang in the yeah. 2020s or whatever. <laughs> right. uh, you know, uh, I feel like you know that's not thinking things through. Yeah, it's also those are hard things. You know, when you're, it's sort of the air you, uh, the beatnik slang, maybe not, but you know, there's the air you breathe if you don't notice it, right? It's hard to like. It can be yeah. very difficult to see out of that, and I think you do a, a very good job of exploring you know, uh, again, whispers of the AI, what that would be like, um, those thought processes. I also like, so he has sort of downgraded himself for a uh, reason. And he's also like not kept backups of, backups of himself. Yes, well, Daslike is, yes, most digital intelligences, of course, store backup copies of themselves because why wouldn't you, right? Um, yeah. 
But Daslak is, as I said, suspicious to the point of paranoia, and he doesn't like to leave his memories lying around where other people could snoop in them. Mm -hmm. It's the same reason that he, it, takes the difficult way of traveling around the solar system of actually shipping his physical body from place to place. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> again, if you're a digital intelligence, you don't have to move yourself. If you want to go from Earth to Mars, you don't have to move yourself to Mars. You must just buy some time on a transmitter and send the contents of your of your memories mm -hmm. to Mars and you know have buy a new body there. And um, so, you know, most of the digital intelligences travel around the solar system much more conveniently. But Daslak is paranoia means that he has to spend a lot of time riding in cargo containers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and I, you know, it's funny, he's sort of like a, um, he's not a Luddite, but you know, he's sort of an old fashioned AI in a way, right? You're yeah. so far in the future, you can have AIs who don't like this new technology in a way. Well, it's again, it's because of his suspicion. For reason, yeah. For reasons which the story eventually makes mm -hmm. clear, I hope. Yeah. Um, you know, again, he doesn't want to be broadcasting his memories all over the solar system mm -hmm. by laser either. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you know, and if it's a good plot device then, so, the, you know, it, it lets him figure out things more that we can figure them out along with him rather than sort of which brings me to the sort of the plot of this which is that it reminded i'm trying to like think of the of the callback it's not really treasure of the sierra madre but something like that or a hitchcock film where maltese falcon Mal, there we go that's what i'm looking for yeah was that Definitely a conscious, one of my influences yeah was that a conscious thing you were kind of like trying to do that a little bit yeah yeah um, um i mean yeah if I, uh, that's always been one of my favorite films and favorite books. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, I, I, I do like the idea of, you know, these all these eccentric characters pursuing something of, of incomprehensible value. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, in addition to Daslak and Z, who are helping Kusti and Adya, and sometimes opposing Kusti and Adya, but mm -hmm. um, um, there's also um, a cat named Moro, who has a couple of um, um, uh, zero gravity type humans, you know, humans with hands on their feet, what, what Lois McGrath de would call quaddies. But um, anyway, uh, a, a rather psychopathic pair of them called um, Keto and um, um, Chi. Um, and then there is the greatest thief in history, just ask him, um, mm -hmm. a guy named Varas Luper who is, um, I, I think he eventually lives up to his name, uh, his, to his title anyway. Um, uh, and then there's, those are all the ones who are trying to get their hands or paws or whatever on the Godel trigger. And then there's also uh, some individuals trying to stop them, including um, Samanus, who is a giant space habitat in the shadow of Jupiter and the reason that Samanus is a giant space habitat in the shadow of Jupiter is that Samanus is utterly paranoid about the inner ring. You know, Samanus is still fighting the war, basically. <laughs> um, and so, you know, has chosen the one place in the solar system where the sun never shines. <laughs> it's, uh, I discovered this quite accidentally while, while writing this, but I think it's cool. So in orbital mechanics, right, you've got the Lagrange points, you know, the and the, the L1 point is, is between the planet and its primary and the L4 and L5 points are 60 degrees ahead and behind it in its orbit. Well, the L2 point is beyond the planet and it is the point at which the, even though it's orbiting further out, it moves at the same angular speed as the planet does. Mm -hmm. So that would be an important position for interplanetary trade because basically if you're going to or from, in this case, Jupiter, from the outer solar system, you're probably going to pass through or near the L2 point. Um, and I, I wanted to know what would Jupiter look like from that location. And so I started doing the math and I realized Jupiter's shadow extends further than that. And this, we're talking like 50 million kilometers yeah. from Jupiter, but Jupiter's shadow, Jupiter is big, Jupiter is far away from the sun. So you know, the shadow of something as big as Jupiter that far away from the sun extends more than 50 million kilometers. So if you're at Jupiter's L2 point, Jupiter is perpetually eclipsing the sun. Mm, okay. 
though Samanus yeah. is in you know is in perpetual darkness yeah. behind yeah. Jupiter, hiding. Yeah. Behind and Samanus is a giant space habitat with a, I think I said a level four intellect, something like that. Anyway, godlike intelligence has a quantum black hole for power to drive a gigawatt launching laser um, and is utterly crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you've got a crazy super intelligence with a giant laser and a black hole. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a, and him and uh, Daslek sort of like spar a little bit. I mean, not right. physically, you know, but, and um, I like that. And yeah, I've, I, I loved, I can't remember, Lapu, Lapu, you know, the, the greatest thief in the, in the solar system. Like that, it was yeah. such a fun character, you know, sort of like the, the suave, you know, whatever. Um, again, kind of felt like something out of like a forties movie or something, you know. A yeah, you, I know, you know. I, except for the fact that I don't picture him as fat, he would be Sydney Green Street from right. the multi yeah. <laughs> He has a lot of his DNA anyway. Yeah. Although I, I recently, in fact, I think it came out yesterday. I did a guest blog post um, for a, a, there's a blog called My Book the Movie, where you basically describe who you would cast in the oh, that's film fun. Yeah. movie. Let's check that for out. that one, I said it would be Gary Oldman with the safety with the safety features turned off. <laughs> yeah, he would be like great. <laughs> If you've uh, ever seen him in the fifth element it's yeah like, right yeah that gary oldman unfettered turned loose on the scenery yeah. <laughs> um yeah and i want to just say too that you know we're talking about these it's sort of it is this great um cat and mouse back and forth who's the the allegiances switch back and forth and you, it keeps you guessing and it um it was a lot of fun to read and i think um it did a great job of combining that kind of like great hard science fiction sense of wonder and then just this really rollicking uh, adventure sort of plot um, married well, really I, well. Yeah. Once I started thinking about that setting, it, it popped out at me that, you know, once I started doing the math about, well, how much, how many people would live in a Dyson sphere civilization? And I got a number like a quadrillion. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that's, you know, so you'd have a billion worlds then, you know, if they live in communities of, of you know, in the millions, then you're gonna have a billion worlds. Mm -hmm. And that started then making me think, well, okay, so you would have, it wouldn't be just that you could have, you would have nearly infinite variety, you know, you would have as many different societies as you have essentially people on earth now. Mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 a space city of a million people is about as important as me. Right. Yeah, and you don't, and I like the book does bounce around. I mean, bounce around maybe sounds negative. Moves through all these different areas and references others. And I thought it was, you know, you don't want to have a billion worlds and then you're stuck on one of them, you know, the whole time. Right, yeah. I mean, there's probably a way to tell that story too. But so like they travel it. from the, the main. So Daslak and Z travel from Raba, which is in uh, the trailing Trojans point for Uranus, to. Um, Uranus orbit, Uranus has a, an artificial ring around it as well as its natural one in this future. Um, and then from there they travel to, to Samanus and then from Samanus they travel to Mars to mm -hmm. via Deimos. And Deimos is one of the superpowers in the solar system. Right, I also, yeah, that was great. That's towards the end of the book, but I love the sort of, um, how Deimos is the, is the more important and Mars is, and there's this like, I don't know. I'm in Texas. Texas, Oklahoma, hatred of each other. You know, or yeah, something, or right? Texas, yeah. and Louisiana. Yes, it would be as if Louisiana yeah. still ruled Texas. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Um, well, uh, I don't want to say too too much more about it because it's it is a sort of a, um, a you plot. Keep skating you, up to giving away the. Yeah, story. I don't want to. I want to say don't want to say too many too much more about it but was there anything um we're actually a, a little over half an hour so we're probably good here but i want to know if there's anything i didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about because uh, well, one thing which yeah. i i want to emphasize i guess is uh, the sort of uh, i alluded to this earlier is that once i started thinking about the, the the you know variety that that setting would allow i realized that this was classic golden age science fiction mm -hmm where you have lots of different worlds and weird creatures and societies all within relatively easy travel range of one another. And in this case, I don't even have to have a, a magic space drive or something, right. you know, they just do it with sails and lasers and rockets. 
and you know so I feel like I, I feel like I should at some point write a story in which a band of rebels are fighting an empire, you know, just mm-hmm. because there are empires there, right. you know. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's an interesting point. Because, like I said, I did feel like that golden age feel, but whereas usually, you know, I think to me reading the old stuff, which I love, but the big thing is just like the the scope of it is hard scientifically to buy at this point, right? You know, it's just it's too easy for the, you know Star Trek is. A, great example and so that's a, that's a fascinating point i hadn't thought of it that way that yeah where you have that scope but it's in our solar system but yet yeah. there's billions of worlds and billions of cultures and- i mean my solar system i think if you do if you take the population i think is bigger than asimov's galactic empire right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah that, that's a fast i didn't i i kind of subconsciously picked up on that i think but i didn't explicitly uh, think of it that way but that's a that's a good way to put it so well it sounds like so it sounds like you're doing another book in this uh yes the the work the book i'm working on now well not right now obviously uh is uh, called the scarab mission and it is set at the same a, a some slightly earlier in time than the godel operation um and it has one character in common which shouldn't be too hard to figure out who that is <laughs> um and um um it's a much less it's a much more uh, 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 much more of a a horror thriller than a comic uh, uh, adventure. Mm. You know, it's it's a group of people are salvaging a wrecked space habitat, and then things go wrong, and mm. then things get worse. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, because you have all these this place space to do things you can tell different stories all in our all in our own backyard of the solar system i guess yep, yep. that's great um well we'll look forward to that um and is there anything else out now you want to plug i mentioned you've done two books with us previously the um arcade's yeah. world and the initiate right uh, so. um, and um let's see there is um i suppose i can pitch i can plug a couple of short stories which okay, are yeah. apropos because they are both billion worlds future short stories one of them is in um athena andreadis's anthology um retellings from the inland seas uh which is published by candlemark and gleam and it's a uh, uh, short science fiction inspired by mediterranean mythology and oh, my cool. story in that is called calando and it's it's set in the billion worlds uh uh, a musician uh, is in difficulty uh, near Neptune. Um, and the other one is forthcoming. It's uh, in an anthology that John Joseph Adams is editing called, I think the current title is Lost Worlds and Mythological Kingdoms. I don't remember what uh, imprint that's going to be under. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wrote a billion worlds lost world story because and it's very literal, right? It's yeah. There's <laughs> a space habitat that's on a really long orbit. Yeah, lose the world. Thousand year orbit, <laughs> and it's come back into the solar system for the first time in centuries, and some people are going aboard. It's a literal lost world story. Yeah. And did you do? I'm trying to think. Did you do one for Bain.com recently? I want to. Say. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know what that anthology is going to be called. No one has told me. Okay. Yeah. We will. We'll, we'll have. I have it up on the website. I think. Right. Okay. Um, so Thank you me. can usually go check out Bain eBooks, and it should pop up hopefully. Um, well, yes, I have a short story. In fact, it's about. Um, it features Adya and Pelagia from uh, mm-hmm. from uh, Godel Operation. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll say the name again. Godel Operation. Here's the. Oh, we look. The cover is Kurt Miller. Great, Kurt yeah. Miller, and there's. I guess yes. that Z and there's a uh, there's yeah, Dash. That's like perched on his shoulder. Yeah. He yeah. also had, did some marvelous artwork of Pelagia, which I I you know I'm almost tempted to like buy a print from him. Yeah, I wonder if he's up on his website or something. Maybe we can take was, a look. Yeah, he sometimes will put up, you know, um, you know, great a spaceship with orca, color. with an orca paint job basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I said, it's out now uh, in trade paperback and uh, however you like your ebooks, we've got it over at Bain.com or of course, wherever you get your ebooks. So uh, Jim Camby, uh, thank you so much for coming on and talking about the the billion worlds of the solar system. Hey, I'll, I'm happy, happy to do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
And now we bring you another installment in our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Salarian League. For hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has worn the Star Kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now, the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now, Honor Harrington is coming for the Salarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. George Benton Tower, City of Old Chicago, Old Earth, Sol System. Well, so much for our wonderful secret weapon, Malachi Abruzzi said bitterly. How the hell am I supposed to sell this as the decisive victory we needed? It's not a complete disaster, Nathan McCartney objected. It looks like Asta worked perfectly. If they'd seen it coming before the last stage lit off, they'd have stopped any of them from getting through, and they didn't. Oh, that makes it much better, Abruzzi half sneered. Now you're telling me I'm supposed to tell the public we fired off 1,200 of these wonderful new missiles, the other side didn't even see them coming until the last second, and we still managed to take out one, count them, Nathan, one of our 11 primary objectives. He shook his head in disgust. I'm pretty good. Hell, I could sell ice on Niflheim. I don't think I can sell this, though. No one expects miracles, Malachi, Inakenti Kolokoltsov told him. We'll just have to do the best we can with what we've got. That's reassuring, Abruzzi muttered. Then he shook himself. I really, really need Kingsford to give me something to work with. I'm sure he will, as soon as he can. Abruzzi snorted, but he also sat back in his chair, arms folded, and Kolokoltsov tried to be grateful for small mercies. Fabius had been almost as big a disaster as Kingsford had privately warned him it might. Unlike the CNO's worst case assumption, based on discovering that the Mantis FTL system defense missiles were already fully operational, almost 10% of Vincent Capriotti's battle cruisers had survived. SLNS Quebec had not been one of them, however, and the remnants of TF 790 had reached Sol less than 11 hours ago. So far, no one outside the Navy and the Mandarins knew they had or had any idea the Solarian League had once again suffered catastrophic losses. It would be a while before Kingsford could provide any sort of comprehensive after-action report or meaningful analysis of the attack's results. Without Capriotti, or for that matter, any of the task group flagships, just pulling together the sensor data was likely to take days. What he called the hot wash analysis Suggested Abruzzi's dismal summary of Capriotti's accomplishments was likely to hold up, though. Kingsford's face had been bitter on Kolokoltsov's comm display as he described the impeller wedges which had interposed themselves between the Astas and their targets. We'd have gotten better results going after something farther from the planet, the CNO had said heavily. We didn't expect that wall of impeller wedges, and we had to be so careful about our targeting commands to avoid civilian casualties that the bird's tactical options were too limited to work around and get behind them, between them and the planet, for an unobstructed shot. We did find that one hole, and it looks like we probably killed at least a dozen of the ships they were using, more likely twice that many. But if I had to guess, they were freighters. Probably unmanned freighters, drones. So, aside from the nano farm, I think it's likely we didn't get another damned thing. I'm sorry, Mr. Senior Permanent Undersecretary. My people tried. Yes, they did, Admiral, Kolokoltsov thought now. And a hell of a lot of them died trying. But Malachi's right. We can't sell this as the win we needed. Anything more on that data anomaly? McCartney asked. No, Kolokoltsov shrugged. Kingsford says his people at operational analysis are working on it, but so far, data anomaly is as far as they've gotten. 
He shrugged again. Frankly, I think Kingsford's pretty much of the opinion that it's a sensor glitch. Only two of Capriotti's recon drones even think they saw it, whatever it was. Good, Abruzzi said with bitter amusement. At least I won't have to explain that one away. Last thing we need is for people to think the Mantis are still producing new secret weapons, especially when ours all seem to suck wind. I have to say, Omasupe Quartermain put in, her tone as subdued and anxious as her expression, that I'm a lot more worried about how the Mantis are going to react to this than I am about what we tell the newsies. Trust Omasupe to cut to the chase, Kola Kultsov reflected. And she had a point. The attack on Beowulf had upped the ante all around, and it was unlikely the Mantis were very pleased about it. Still, there were a few glimmers in the darkness. Even from Kingsford's current partial analysis, it was obvious McCartney was right. The Mantis had never even seen Asta coming until the final stages went active. That meant the weapon had performed almost exactly as advertised. If not for the freighters they'd managed to interpose, the strike would have been just as devastating as anyone could have hoped. And the fact that at least some of their technology had worked perfectly, that the Mantis' monopoly on superior weapons wasn't absolute after all, was at least a little reassuring. According to Kingsford and Vice Admiral Kendrick, Systems Development Command and Technodyne were working on half a dozen other projects, which should begin yielding results sometime within the next eight to 12 T months. How good those results would be was an unknown. But if Asta was representative, they might just provide a genuine equalizer, especially if they were employed en masse. And the preliminary vote on the taxation amendment went our way overwhelmingly, Kolokoltsov reminded himself. If Nang and Tyrone Reed are right, it'll sail through on the final vote week after next, too. If that happens, we'll have all the money we need to buy anything systems development wants. We just have to hang on long enough for that to happen, and the Mantis are friggin' history. He reminded himself of that firmly, very firmly. And somewhere under that reassurance, he heard the lonely sound of whistling in a cemetery. That was another installment in our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to James L. Cambius for sitting down to talk with me about his new novel, The Goodell Operation. And thanks as always to our regular host, Tony Daniel. You know, Tony is such a great guy. Recently, he's been doing a lot of community service, really giving back. He even became a volunteer fireman. He's got a badge and an official number and everything. The number is 451, by the way. He was really proud of that. You know, when I talked to him last, he had just come from a big fire at the public library. He was covered in soot. He told me that he was going to go to the Bain offices and, quote, take care of the books there next really inspiring. I'm sure he'll tell you all about his public service next week when he's back on the podcast. Until then, I'm David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>